uh, we'll see the hand of God. But what a great honor it is for me to labor with Lakeside and with Brother Larry and Sister Vicki. Uh, no two people in this world mean any more to me than them and their family. And, and I love them so dearly. And how I, I just, um, I'm encouraged uh, by all the folks that are watching, um, all the folks that have been listening. Um, you know, I preach to roughly 100, maybe 150 on most Sundays. And now we're reaching a couple thousand. Some of our live feeds have hit over 3,700. And that, that just amazes me. But I'm glad that the gospel is getting out and that the gospel is still reaching folks. And I'm glad there is a day that we have set aside. We call it Good Friday, but it was one of the darkest days in human history, probably the darkest day in human history. And one of the old writers talked about the darkness of the cross, and he said it was a gross and a thick darkness. I don't believe our minds can even comprehend that. But um, those of you that have your Bibles, I'm going to jump right into the scripture, and I, I just pray um, that I can be uh, short-winded. I, I struggle with that nowadays. I, um, and some of my church are watching, and they're probably laughing at that comment right now. But I promise you, I'm going to try to be just as brief. But on a day like this, uh, trying to expound on Calvary, and trying to expound on the price that Jesus paid. I, I, I believe we need to give him just a little more time today. And y'all bear with me. So in Matthew chapter number 27, if you would turn there very quickly. And I, I want to bring you today to a moment at Calvary. And not just any moment, to what I believe was the greatest moment at Calvary. Because it was the last moment. And it was the moment that set every other thing in motion. And let me just say this to you. I believe every good thing that has ever happened in David McGregor's life has happened as a result of Calvary. Every blessing that I've ever had, every good thing that God has ever done is because of Calvary. So let me just read this scripture to you very quickly. Um, Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 20. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks ran, and the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were watching him, they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Go back up to verse number 50, if you would. And I love the way that verse starts out. It just starts out as Jesus. Can I say there, all the preachers and all of history together have never fully and completely expounded. That's, that one word is something that you and I could never preach out. I, I could fold up my Bible and go to the house and sit down and, and, and say that was enough. Jesus, I want you to know that Jesus is enough today. Jesus, you, you can say Muhammad, you can say Buddha, you can say Smith and all these other names and people's okay with that. But the very moment that you mentioned Jesus. I believe Satan and all hell trembles at that name. Jesus, when he had cried with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Can I say to you what Jesus said one time? He said, no man takes my life. He said, but I lay down my life and I'll take it back up again. Somebody said, well, who killed Jesus? Can I tell you nobody killed Jesus? He freely gave his life. He was the only man who ever had the power to say that now is the time that I'm going. And he dismissed his own spirit and he gave up the ghost and he died. But look at verse number 51 and behold, he, he's saying this, 
watch this. I don't want you to miss this. So what I want you to do with me today, I want you to take a trip with me. Let's go back about 2,000 years and halfway around the world, and let's sit down at Calvary for just a moment. And and I'm talking about the last moment today. Now, I know so many of the things that God does are progressive works. God does great works over time. He grows us. He teaches us. He sanctifies us over time. But can I say the greatest works that Jesus does, he does in a moment? In a moment, the Spirit of God will take the gospel and speak to somebody's heart. And in that moment, they'll turn to him and be saved by his precious grace. In a moment, the Holy Ghost will blow into a service and revival will sweep over that place and it'll never be the same. In a moment, some backslidden, wayward child of God, the Spirit will touch them and repentance will well up in their heart and they'll never be the same. Can I say to you, the greatest moment that you'll ever have is a moment at Calvary and the sad fact of the matter is millions will live and they'll die and they'll never have their moment at Calvary. And if you meet Christ, you will meet him at Calvary. Yeah. You don't meet outside Amen. of Calvary. But it's amazing how just moments can change our life. Just moments will set the reset button in our life. I can tell you today where I was standing when the planes hit the towers, the New York Trade Center. I can tell you exactly where I was at and what I was doing and, and something just hit the reset button in my life and began to make me reprioritize. I, I remember very distinctly when the Columbine shootings happened. I remember me and my Aunt Ellie sitting on the, on the couch to the first little apartment that Jen and I rented. And I remember her watching that news broadcast and right in the middle of that, beginning to cry out to God. See, in a moment, the, the things in our life, God can make an eternal change in just a moment. But can I say this to you, that no matter how many moments that you have in your life, if you don't have a moment at Calvary, you've missed it all. I've had a lot of great moments. One of the greatest moments I've ever had was standing at an altar and pledging to love and to be faithful to my wife. Another great moment is when I was in that delivery room when my children were being born. But can I say to you, there has never been another moment in my life like that moment I had as a little lost seven-year-old boy when I was lost without Christ and the gospel came by my way and showed me how desperate a need that I had in my life. And at a moment, I turned to Christ and asked him to save me. And my life has never been the same since that moment at Calvary. So my prayer today is that somebody by faith will take a trip to that old rugged cross outside of the gates of Jerusalem and see a Savior that loved you so much that he would give his only life. But let's go back to that last moment at Calvary, to what I believe is the greatest moment. And you say, preacher, what's so sufficient? What's so big about that last moment at Calvary? Can I say the first thing about that last moment? It was a moment of real access. Let's read the scripture, verse number 51. Again, look at it. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. That that was shut off, that that was cut off, that that we couldn't go beyond. We had no access, but in a moment, Christ made perfect access for you and I. Now to us, that veil don't mean much, but to those people that had seen it for hundreds of years, they had never went before or behind it, but they had seen it hanging there for hundreds upon hundreds of years. And even if they didn't see it, the high priest would tell them about it. It, it was 60 feet tall, 30 feet wide, and four inches deep of purple 
purple and blue and scarlet and fine twine linen. And on that curtain was embroidered cherubims that represented the presence of God and the throne of God. And I'll tell you, you did not go behind that veil. Do you remember when Adam and Eve fell in the garden and they began to create aprons for their sale of fig leaves? You know what they were doing? They were creating a veil. They were creating a covering for their sin. They were hiding behind that. And, and when Christ, when they were driven out of the garden, watch this, there were flaming swords, cherubims, put there to keep the way of the tree of life. And we were cut off from that holy place, that most holy place. Oh, but you look at this in a moment. I'm telling you, you didn't go behind there. You, you just the priest went back there and he went one time a year and he didn't go without blood. And watch what they would do with that priest. They had tie a rope around his ankle and they would put a bell and a pomegranate and a bell and a pomegranate along the bottoms of that long flowing robe that he wore. And when he went back there, they would wait in breathless expectation for the sound of the bells to ring. And that was saying to them that God was accepting the sacrifice. You couldn't go back there. I couldn't go back there. The manifested presence of God was in that holiest of holiest. The Ark of the Covenant was back there. But I want you to watch what happened in a moment at Calvary. I believe God looked over the balcony of heaven and he saw the sacrifice that his son would pay. He saw the final atonement for the sin of all humanity. And watch what the Bible says. A man didn't get a hold of that veil and rip it in two. He couldn't have if he wanted to. But I believe God Almighty reached over the balcony of heaven. And the Bible says from the top, to the bottom, he ripped that veil. And once that veil was a no trespassing sign, once that veil said to you and I, do not enter her. Once that veil said we have no access, but now through Christ, praise God, we have access into the holy of holiness. You may be out there today and listen to me and you are lost without God. Understand this, that your sin and your iniquities have separated between you and your God. None of us have access outside of Christ. And can I say this to you? Wants to be inside the veil could mean potential death. But to today, to be outside of the veil is certain death. Look at this. His separation became our reconciliation. Look, it's midnight in the middle of the day and darkness has covered the earth. And there's a cry from that middle cross. Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Oh my goodness, Jesus even had some wives. But can I answer that question for you? When Jesus would say to his father, why would you turn your back on me? On this side of the cross, I could say this, he was separated so you and I would never have to be separated from God. He was forsaken of his father. So when David McGregor would come to him, I would have perfect access through the blood and the sacrifice that Jesus paid on the cross of Calvary. It reminds me of a story that I tell sometimes when I'm preaching. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was going to that great metropolitan church to preach the gospel. And there when he got to the door, the side door where he would go in, and there was a little boy off to the side, just a little street boy. His hair all messed up and his clothes were dirty. And they said Spurgeon was a very tender-hearted man. And he walked over to that little boy and he said, son, he said, what's wrong? 
And that little boy looked at him and he said, sir, he said, I walked from my house to hear the greatest preacher that's ever lived preach. And he said, now they're telling me there's no room. There's ushers at the door and they say that I can't get in. I don't have access. And watch what Spurgeon said to that little boy. He said, well, I'm going in. And the little boy didn't even know he was talking to Spurgeon. He said, I'm going in. He said, do you want to go with me? He said, sir, I don't think it's going to work. He said, yeah, it'll work. He said, this is what I want you to do. He said, you just get a hold of my pant leg. And he said, when I go in, he said, you go with me. And he walked in through that sea of hundreds and hundreds of people, took him up on the stage with him. And there was a seat reserved there by Spurgeon. And he said that little boy here in that seat, that boy looked at Spurgeon and he said, Mr. I've never seen anything like this. He said, but I've got one question for you. He said, where is Mr. Spurgeon? And Spurgeon looked at him. He said, I am Charles Spurgeon. And he said, in just a moment, I'm going to preach the gospel. And he said, you you are my honored guest today. You know what that reminded me of? That reminded me of myself without Christ. That reminds me of this world. That little boy had tried every door to get him there. Oh, they try baptism. They try sacraments of religion. They try all that they can, and it just won't get them in. Oh, but I've got good news. Christ came to receive us and watch what happened to me when Christ came to me when he went in I went in with him when he died I died with him when he arose I rose with him when he ascended I ascended with him and I'm not just standing in my living room today I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus all because in a moment at Calvary he made access for you and I. Not only do we have access by that last moment at Calvary, let me show you something else. Go to verse number 51, if you would. Look at this. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Now, do you remember just a few days ago, Jesus would make his triumphal entry down into Jerusalem, and watch what they begin to shout. I'm going somewhere with this. Watch as they begin to shout as he began to make his way down into Jerusalem. They begin to cry, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Ain't it amazing to you how fickle we can be, how quick we can change. All this day we're praising him. But on the day, on Good Friday, or whatever day you believe or observe that Christ died, on that day, they're crying away with him and crucify him. But look, as Jesus is riding down into Jerusalem, and they begin to cry, Hosanna, there's some Pharisees there. Can I tell you, there's always some Pharisees there. And there's nothing like a good move of the Spirit of God to show you who the Pharisees are. They get real uncomfortable when things get out of the normal. They get real uncomfortable when the Spirit of God and the presence of God makes itself real. And the Pharisees, and I'm just paraphrasing here, they looked at Christ and they said, tell your disciples to be quiet. And I love what Jesus said to those Pharisees. He said, I'm going to tell you right now, if these hold their peace, he said, even the very rocks will cry out. So look at this. Look what I believe this moment is. I told you a moment at Calvary is a moment of access, that last moment. But not only was that last moment a moment of access, it was a moment of true worship. You know what I believe this was? Well, let me set the stage for you before I even get to the point. Where are all the miracle mongers at? Where's those 5,000 that he fed? Nobody here is worshiping Christ at this time. Where is loudmouth Peter that is always speaking? He's in hiding with the rest 
of the disciples. John's there, but John don't offer no word of praise. Mary is there, but she's so overcome with grief that she don't have anything to say. I wonder where the ten lepers were at. I wonder where the blind man that he healed were at. I wonder where all those that he raised from the dead were at. There's nobody to be seen. But look at this. Jesus says, if they hold their peace, he said, the rocks are going to cry out. You know what I believe this moment is? This was a moment of true worship. I believe it was his creation recognizing their creator, recognizing the one that by him all things were made and without him was not anything made. It was a moment of worship where they recognized him that said, let there be light, and there was light. And I believe God's creation began to groan and begin to quake. And even the rocks on that day of Calvary, when nobody else, none of his followers were worshiping him, creation said, we'll worship him. By the way, can I get personal with you today? Can I ask you, when was the last time that you really worship him. I'm not asking you when was the last time that you went to church. It's been weeks for all of us. If it's been that long since you worship him, it's been too long. Have you lost the wonder of your worship? Have you lost your zeal and excitement? Has the work of God become a drudgery to you? Can I tell you, when I get cold, and we all do, when I get indifferent, when I get backslidden on God, you know what I do? I remember what we celebrate today. And I take me a trip and I'll have me a moment at Calvary. And something within me wells up and says that he is so beyond all my worth, the worthiness of my praise and my honor and my glory. And a moment at Calvary will fix it for me every time. So look, we've got a moment of access. We've got a moment of worship in that last moment. Let's see what else we got. Go to verse number 52 and 53. And let me read this to you. And the graves were open, and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now look, this is the only record of this we'll find in the scripture. But the Bible says that the very moment that Christ died, that grave is opened up. I believe the very moment that Christ yielded up the ghost and Christ the telescope, it is finished. I believe there were stones begin to roll off of the mouths of the tombs. Now look, I don't believe they got out of the grave until after Jesus' resurrection because he became the first fruits of them that would sleep. But look what I see. This moment, it's interesting that the moment of death for Christ became the moment of life for you and I. If you want real life and eternal life, go to Calvary. If you want abundant life, Take you a trip to Calvary. It's a moment of true life. Oh, I just started living, they used to say. Look at this. The cross was not the end, but the cross was the beginning. Hey, you see that man carrying that cross? He's a dead man walking. They don't come back from that. There's no hope. It's a dead end for him. But watch what Jesus did. Jesus took that cross and he built a bridge and he made a way to bridge that gulf to glory. And with one hand, he reached to a thrice holy God. And with the other hand, he reached down to fallen man and he became that mediator that the old writer began to search after that day's man. And he brought us back together. But you know what the sad reality, and I see it happening so much in churches today. 
You know what the sad reality of Calvary is? Is that sometimes we only talk about Calvary when we're trying to win the loss. We only talk about Calvary when we're trying to be evangelistic. But can I tell you what you and I that are saved by God's grace need on this Good Friday, we need to reflect on Calvary. And not only on this Good Friday, we need to go back every day of our lives and have a moment of Cal at Calvary. And this was a moment of true life. So look, I see we got a moment of access. We've got a moment of worship. We got a moment of real life. But I want you to see, and this is my last one. I promise you, I'm going to try to be very brief. Go to verse number 54. Let me show you what I believe this moment was. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake, and those things that were done. And they feared greatly saying, truly, this was the son of God. You know what else I believe that last moment at Calvary was? It's a moment of real change. And can I be honest with you and speak probably for my pastor that's watching and speak for every preacher and every evangelist and every pastor that has ever lived. This is how I think as a pastor. I'll preach and then I'll leave that place and I'll wonder. And sometimes I'll even express that wonder to Jennifer. And I'll say, I wonder, will it make a change in them? I wonder, does anything change in their lives? And I believe the gospel always changes you. But we can't help but wonder, will things change? Let me say this to you. A sermon's not going to change your life. A message from a preacher is not going to change your life. But there's one thing that will change your life, and it's a moment at Calvary. You cannot go to Calvary and see him hanging there and bleeding and dying for your sin. You can't hear him crying out on your behalf in his darkest hour, Father, forgive them they know not what they do you can't have a moment at calvary and not be changed by that moment look who is saying this truly this was the son of god it's the centurion he's the hardest man at the cross he's killed hundreds probably thousands by crucifixion he's the one that gives the death orders it's all in a day's work for him. He's the one that curses and swears. Oh, but he's not doing that at this moment. He's had true change. There's reality that's come into his life. And no longer is he cursing and swearing and telling them to carry it out. But he's saying truly, this was the son of God. My goodness, just a glance at Calvary will let you have a reality in who Christ really is. They used to sing, I believe it was the Imperial, used to sing an old song. It won't be old Buddha that's sitting on the throne. It won't be old Muhammad that's waving us home. It won't be her Krishna that sings the welcome song. It'll be Jesus and that moment at Calvary. One glimpse of Jesus is a moment of true change. He can change you today. Let me say that to somebody that's out there that feels hopeless. Let me say to some deadbeat dad out there, he can change you and make a real father out of you. Let me say to some woman that's out there that don't feel love and has tried relationship after relationship and nothing has changed in your life, can I say he can make a real change out of you? Can I say to some young person that feels hopeless today and feels so all alone, he can make a change in you? Because the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. God don't just take that old man and change him. He gives you new life and he gives you life 
more abundantly. I'm going to share something with you today. His name was Isaac Newton. Just a just a teen Isaac Watts, rather, just a teenage boy in the 1700s. His dad was a pastor, and they had left church. And he said what some of us had felt like in the past. Not songs like the old rugged cross, but on the way home, he looks at his dad. He said, I don't like them old dry, starchy hymns that we sing in church every Sunday. And his dad looked at him and said, son, write better ones and we'll sing them. And little did he know that Isaac would go home and take his pen and begin to write. Watch at the words that he wrote. I believe it's so fitting for Good Friday. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Well, might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in when Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin. But drops of grief can never pay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away is all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart was rolled away. It was there by faith that I received my sight. And now, now I'm happy all the day. She was blind, sitting in a church service, and they began to sing that song. And they got down to the last verse of that song. But drops of grief can never pay the debt of love I owe. Dear Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. A 31-year-old blind Fanny Crosby bowed her head right in the pew where she sat. And she said, Lord, I'm blind. Lord, I don't have much that I can offer you. She said, but I give it all to you. She said, I give myself away. And she became one of the greatest missionaries and one of the greatest soul writers that have ever lived because at a moment, see there it is, at a moment she gave herself away. Uncle John was his name, as they affectionately called him, John Baxter. He was preaching a revival in a little village. He was making his rounds, just cold calling, going from house to house, knocking on doors. I'm preaching a revival, would you come? Finally, he got to what he said was a fine home. A well-dressed lady came to the door and he introduced himself and said, I'm preaching a revival at so-and-so church. And she cursed and swore and slammed the door in his face. They said John turned around and got to the steps of that woman's house and he sat down and he began to sing this song, and he got to the last verse of it. But drops of grief can never pay the debt of love I owe. And I said he began to break down and to weep and to cry. And he got to church that night. And when he stood to preach, he saw that same woman walk into the church house. And he said she wept through the whole service. She was the first one to come and respond to the altar call. And he said, ma'am, he said, what's different? He said, this is, this is not how we met earlier. She said, as I listened to you sing that song, she said, all day long, I just couldn't get away from those drops of grief. Can I say to you that thousands of years and millions of miles and thoughts and sermons behind us. Can I say, David McGregor still can't get over those drops that he shed. I can't get over what he done. I've never got over that my king would bear my sin. I've never got over that in a moment he would make access for me that I could come in 
and be a royal descendant and a child of God. So while Jason just plays some music very softly, let me say this for you today. Whether you've been saved for just a few hours, whether you've been saved for just four or five days, or whether you've been saved for a half a century, you know what you need to do? You need to take a trip to Calvary. If you're listening to me today, and you're lost without God, oh, you might have turned all this broadcast and this live feed today lost as lost to be. But you'll be able at the end of it to say that I'm saved by the grace of God. If you're willing by faith to take a trip to Calvary, and maybe some of you that's cold and indifferent on God, maybe some of you that it's been a long time since you made that trip up that lonely hillside outside of the gates of Jerusalem. Maybe it's been a while since you had a moment at Calvary. But today, I encourage you to go there. It'll change your life forever. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, it's been a long time since you've really worshipped Him. Maybe, maybe you're out there and your life is so bad that you say, I don't care if I live or die. A moment in Calvary, I told you, that that was intended to be a moment of death, it was a moment of life, and it can become a moment of life for you. Those of you that have tried and tried and tried by religion, tried by good words to just turn over a new leaf, and you say, preacher, I've tried everything, but no change. He can make a real change in your life today. So let me encourage you. If God is speaking to you today and you respond to this, you respond and let us know that you have responded to the gospel message today. And he's just as close to you as the breath in your lungs. And he'll hear you if you'll call on him today. Lakeside, I love you. Thank you so much for letting me share in the word with you. Thank you to my church and all the multitude that is out there listening today. Let's just all take a trip to Calvary on this good Friday. And I promise you, after Calvary, things will never be the same for you again. I love you guys. God bless you.